This year we're celebrating St. Lucie County's 100 year anniversary. I'm Sheriff Ken Mascara, St. Lucie County's 11th elected and current sheriff. St. Lucie County uh, over the past 100 years has reached many milestones. The St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office has been part of that through the tragic and untimely deaths of Sheriffs Monroe and Carlton to the enthusiastic capture of the Ashley Gang, the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office is rich in history. Part of our 100-year tradition has been patrolling and serving St. Lucie County. Pat Duval, the first African-American deputy hired for the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, and retired Chief Deputy Warren Alford will discuss some of those milestones with you as they saw them while patrolling the streets of St. Lucie County. We hope you enjoy this edition and thank you. I think that they respected law enforcement uh, much better back then. Uh, one thing I saw, the, depart the department come up from 300, from, from, from 4 down to 300. <laughs> but in the early years, we, we, we did all of it. And you just had to work. You had to work. Early 70s, drugs uh, started running rampant. But the one thing they always said, don't ever treat anybody other than the way you want to be treated. Laws were easier to enforce back then because uh, the citizens had respect for law enforcement officers. I can't explain it. We just worked because the people needed us. I started in February of 1956. Started off as a night jailer working from six at night till uh, eight in the morning. Uh, altogether, I think there were seven of us for the whole department plus uh, the sheriff. So there were nine, uh, as I recall, there were nine, uh, eight, or eight or nine of us on the department back in 56. Yeah, we had our own cars. Everybody had his own car and we leased them to the sheriff's department. We had a mixture of Chevrolets, the Ford, Mercury, and later on the Oldsmobile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this was, oh my God, this must have been, it was in the 50s. I think we had, uh, at that time, had uh, several marked units. Some of them were in uh, unmarked cars. Uh, I say unmarked, they had uh, magnetic signs that we put on the side of, stars that we put on the side of some of the cars. Some of the deputies owned their own cars and got paid car allowances. I don't recall exactly how, how much it was. It wasn't very much. We had, uh, we had at that time, we had to put the radios in the trunk because most of the cars were six volt. Uh, uh, wait a minute, when the 12 volts came out, we put the six the radios back in the, in the trunk. And then we had a, a, a six volt battery to run the, the radio, then the 12 volt was in the in the, in the front, so it was kind of a mixed up thing, and we only had one guy that could fix them. That was his name was Snow. He lived. <laughs> he, uh, I remember coming through uh, Havana, Florida, and the the, the uh, rectifier broke loose. Well, nobody would touch it. <laughs> they didn't know what it was, <laughs> so I had to tell. You unhooked the whole battery and every the whole thing, you know. It was kind of weird, you know. When uh, I came to work, our radios, the Sheriff's Department radios, were with the City of Fort Pierce. And uh, City of Fort Pierce had a small tower. And uh, when we got probably uh, past King's Highway, and uh, if the weather conditions were real good, we could get in by radio. But uh, if you got up way out on the county line, sometimes it was really hard to get in. And we got our radios, uh, our own radios, in uh, the latter part of 1958. They added a uh, radio room to the back of the old county jail, the building that was built in 1925. And uh, our radio antenna was right in the back of the jail. And uh, we started our radio system sometime in the latter part of uh, 58. 
Yeah, we first got the the, the, the walkie talkies that the army had, you know. And they they were, weren't too good in the army because we had used them in the army over in France, over there and in Germany. And then we had some of those, they weren't worth a dime. Then you had this big thing. It was uh, it was like a, a T-model, no, you wouldn't know a T-model fat, fat, fat battery. But the battery was about like this, you know. You've seen those batteries about that high? And then you had the phone sitting on top of it. Have you seen that thing ever? It's so heavy, you, <laughs> you, you wouldn't go away. <laughs> you had to be staked out or something. You couldn't carry that thing anywhere. And then at half time, you, it, it, um, it, it, you, you can, you can get anybody on it. It's very, very unreliable. That was the first, first boat that uh, we obtained, uh, and I think that was in the in the latter part of the '60s. Actually, I, they only patrolled sometimes on on the weekends, unless the boat was needed somewhere. But mostly on the weekends is when uh, that and that was that was operated by uh, some special deputies that we had back there. We obtained a helicopter. Uh, in the early 60s, or I guess it was in the late 60s, when we, uh, our first helicopter was uh, a Hiller, very small aircraft. That it, uh, it seems like we got that from a little town in Mississippi. And then later on, in the early 70s, we uh, obtained a uh, Hughes, and that was uh, trucked here. Uh, from uh, Arizona. Uh, actually, it was trucked here by one of our former deputies and a deputy who was working here at the time. We only had one pilot that was working with us uh, at that time. Later on, we had uh, a couple. Um, and we had some civilians that uh, sometime uh, operated uh, the helicopter for us if they needed it. That was very seldom. Well, I knew it was one right, you know, tip-top shape. We both knew that, and we and I kept after them about fixing the darn thing. And I went down there one day and I told, I said, I go down to him to Lanny. I said, Look here, I go down to the barn, and who's working on the damn helicopter? The damn mechanic, the car mechanic, we're fixing the helicopter. What the hell's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't want to spend any money on it. They got, they got a mechanic, a Ford mechanic. <laughs> this is ridiculous. You will get somebody killed with this kind of foolishness, you know? We uh, went into uniforms in October of 1957. Prior to that time, we uh, naturally were in civilian clothes and uh, made it kind of tough on... Uh, on enforcing the uh, law at that time. The uniforms we found out later and after we obtained them that uh, it was much easier to in stopping people and, uh, and uh, talking to people. I know the guy came around and he measured us up and all that stuff. Sort of thing. I don't remember when then the sheriff had us line up and took pictures. And I think, but it, you can see they were very new. <laughs> what was it? Was eight of us? Seven or eight of us? Yeah, I think it's seven, eight. Yeah. I think that they respected law enforcement uh, much better back then. I think the uh, laws were easier to enforce back in because uh, the citizens had a respect for law enforcement officers. I had a very good working relationship with uh, Captain Duval. Uh, he was a hometown boy, I am too, and uh, knew his brother, knew his mother, and uh, we worked very well together. Pat really didn't get too much relief from, uh, there were no set hours back then that uh, we worked until we went home. I wasn't interested in uh, being a policeman. I didn't know anything about it. And then uh, about uh, September, my job that I, I was working with the East Coast, they were going to close the place, you know. 
So I decided to try being a cop. And uh, it, it was kind of miserable to start with because you didn't know what what to do. And uh, in the first three or four days, then the sheriff would ride with me and all this sort of thing. And, uh, and we were on the fee system then when we came in. I don't know it's just how it worked. The uh, county offices back then, the sheriff's office included, was uh, was on uh, the fee system, and uh, the uh, sheriff's office would get uh, on an arrest would get a seven dollar and fifty cent fee, which went to the county. They would also get a fee for uh, what they call a turnkey fee of a dollar and a half. You'd get a dollar and a half for fingerprinting a prisoner, and you'd get a dollar and a half for uh, approving the bond when uh, he went out on bond. And you would also get uh, so much a mile for however far you had to bring the prisoner in. The uh, highway patrol back then would hardly ever bring uh, somebody that they arrested to the jail. They'd call the sheriff's office and uh, the sheriff would send one of the deputies out and pick up the uh, person that the highway patrolman had arrested and bring him in and the deputy would get paid, uh, or the, the office, the sheriff's office would get paid mileage for bringing that, uh, for that uh, prisoner in. And, uh, sheriff Noble at that time was not satisfied with it. He uh, was trying to figure out ways to do it and finally, I don't know just how it happened, they went to Tallahassee and about and I remember the, well, the sheriff, I believe his name was Blackburn from, from somewhere down the road. They, all, they headed it and they went to Tallahassee and got it and uh, removed the fee system. Now, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but the, it, uh, shortly after I became a deputy sheriff, they, they, the state outlawed that sort of thing, you know. My salary was $240 a month when I started in 1956. Ever, all of them were 240 with the exception of the chief deputy. I think the chief deputy was making 300 a month. The sheriff had just got a raise, which is set by uh, the state uh, and population-wise of the county. Uh, the sheriff had just got a raise, I believe, to $7,500 a year. What? Oh man, we worked. With fit. We didn't get a day off for five years. Um, maybe it's around five years, or something like that. And I remember telling the sheriff that I, I didn't think I was making over thirteen cents an hour in <laughs> the we, we were working. But it was another thing. Another thing about this, we did. They didn't. De uh, the sheriff didn't demand that you worked like this. I think. Uh, we just, I, I can't explain it. We just worked because the people needed us. Because I know a lot of times uh, uh, I would work, from, we'd go maybe 8 o'clock, start in the day, or 8 o'clock that morning, and sometime you didn't go to bed until around about 3 o'clock the next morning. And they, you just worked long as the people needed you. Now, how that happened, I don't know, but we did it, and we did that until 1958, uh, I believe it was, 57, 1957, and then we, the force went up from, from three deputies to, uh, I think it was eight, and we were relieved then, you know, because we could go home around 10 o'clock. <laughs> But I was right in the middle of the city. And we, it made my family miserable because people would come to the house. And that was, they would come there for, for everything, you know. Just, and, and, and well, it was so bad that I had a friend, her name was uh, Miss Moore, lived on 12th Street, Julia Bell Moore. I would go to her house rather than after I would eat. I'd go to her house and and sleep on the porch, you know, 
they were still, still so that they, uh, they wouldn't find the car, could have parked my car behind the back of, back of the house. But we didn't actually have a road patrol until, uh, per se, it's, uh, until the 60s, until we established, uh, until we got more people. The, the deputies, the road patrol deputies, uh, served civil papers. They worked the courtroom. They would uh, transport prisoners back and forth from uh, the court. Of course, back then the jail was attached to the courthouse, but we still had to have, uh, when we'd take 18 or 20 inmates uh, from the jail to court and put them in separate courtrooms, we had to have guards for them, and road patrol would assist in that. Uh, in later years, when we got more people, uh, we broke into jail people would handle the, the inmates and uh, we established a road patrol and that was later on in the 60s and the detective bureau. But uh, that, that was the way that, that came about. But in the early years, we, we, we did all of it. We worked in the jail and, and served civil papers, worked in the office, and worked in the courtroom and uh, served warrants. Back then, uh, you knew everybody in town. You could pick up the phone and say, hey, Charlie, we got a warrant for you. You're going to have to come down here, get your bondsman, and come down here and post this $50 bond. Some of them, some of them you'd have to go get, but uh, not many. We had a little trouble, but it was all within the scope of a, being a cop. You have guys resisted, white and black, but you had to stand your ground. It's either that, you wouldn't be able, and the way I figured it, if I backed off and I had the authority and invested in, in me, and then if I let that go there one time, I might as well give up the job. And I had three or four children and a wife, and I wasn't about to give up the job. So then, you know, so we had, I had uh, trouble out of some of the whites and some of the blacks. But uh, I didn't dwell on that. And after a while, I didn't know. I, I didn't know. I don't know. Usually when I told a fella that he was under arrest, we went. So we didn't have a heck of a lot of trouble. I think I had less trouble uh, uh, resisting arrest than, than, than anybody, any cop in this county. Well, I tell you what, and I, and I get. I remember one thing that when my dad was, he was a heck of a guy. I thought he 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 would talk to me a lot, but because he died prior to me coming here. But the one thing he always said: don't ever treat anybody other than the way you want to be treated. Now that was something we grew up with. We grew up with that, and I think it carried me all the way through. I always thought about that. I don't care. What happened? If I didn't, if this, I didn't like it, then I just couldn't do it to this guy. And this was something he cared, he he cared, you know. He, I remembered about what he said about people, and uh, I think that that was good for me. This county uh, handled a lot of citrus and uh, and farming, tomato farming. We had, uh, and with seasonal work, we had, uh, we dealt with a lot of uh, burglaries. And uh, of course we considered back then if we had a burglary every day, it was a lot of burglaries. Uh, now they have multitude, uh, multitudes of burglaries during the week. And we would have sometimes three or four, which we thought was quite a bit. You had Belita, you had narcotics, he had murder, Don Neal murders, moonshine, and uh, you had liquor stills around. They ran a lot of moonshine into this county. Uh, it would come from uh, from Okeechobee County, mostly from Okeechobee County at that time, and uh, Indian River County. And we had several stills here that uh, were broken up. We, we would confiscate, uh, they would haul these, uh, <clears throat> these uh, five gallon tins of uh, moonshine and uh, 
confiscate them. We'd put them in the jail and uh, keep them until after trial and then get orders to destroy them. Yes, some came from Okeechobee. I've had some of the moonshiners. And I remember one time I was at Angle Road and Avenue D about 3 o'clock in the morning and uh, I see this guy that said, I said, and I thought it was his car, but there was a woman driving it. And I thought, that was a, that was a funny looking woman, you know? And it dawned on me, he, <laughs> the guy, he would have put on that, uh, had on a, a, a dress. Uh -huh. And, 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 a, and, a, and a, actually he had a bonnet on too, yeah, he had a bonnet like you see somewhere in the country, something like that. And they would do anything like, to, to get by you, you know? And you just had to work. You had to work, and uh, I would, uh, I remember it, it, it murders and all that sort of thing. You had to stay there. Yeah, there was no going home until you, that's the way I figured. Somebody was killed, I stayed on it until uh, everything run, ran out. If it was daylight, okay, it was all right. As long as you got a lead, stay on it, stay on it. And the quicker you do that, and the longer you stay on it, the quicker you, you get your case solved. Well, s sometimes, sometimes it was hard work. You know, but <coughs> you start from the, from, from like the dopes are sellers and this, well, you might have a tip, or uh, you see the guy's delivering, where you want to know where it comes from. So you, you follow him, and what I would do, I'd follow him maybe by three blocks or four blocks. Then I cut off and the next week I'd follow him. I knew where he was when it was, you know, last time I saw him and I'd wait, wait, sometimes it'd take around about a month or two or three months to, uh, to track him down. And then you find out who's doing what and that's, that's the way I used to do it. And sometimes somebody would tell me, maybe get a tip, but you always had to do leg work. And one thing, the reason I believe shine was prevalent during those days is because the, the, we didn't have any whiskey on Sundays. I think it stopped selling at a two o'clock or two o'clock, one or two o'clock Saturday night, you know, then the shine would take over. But after the, the legislature stopped, uh, uh, enacted the law where you could sell liquor until two o'clock, or an open, no, it opened two o'clock, uh, then uh, we didn't have so much shine after that. But after that, before that, we had a heck of a lot of it. On Second Street, where the old deal was with this one, this was where he, the sheriff was was pouring this shine out uh, <coughs> and, the, and the manhole was stopped up <laughs> and it was going down the river. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Anyway, I was going going to the bank and I went through the back and I looked down there and there was a river of shine running down the place. And that was Red scooping it up with a cup. He was a trusty and had a cigarette in his hand and I grabbed a cigarette because I if he dropped it and they were afraid to have a chain reaction all the way back to that. <laughs> it blew up the whole place. <laughs> yeah, we ran into a steal one time. And I had been trying to get Sheriff Novel to, to go with me, you know. Uh, uh, Lanny was the chief then. And I, we didn't have, still didn't have a lot of people, you know, so he didn't know we were going to get this steal. And, uh, we went out there and we were working and it was moon shining bright. And we went out there. I don't think the guy was trying to kill us, but he shot a couple of times and we took off. <laughs> That's like, like still out there. <laughs> when we went down, next day we went back over there and they had moved the whole thing. They had it. See, they've got this thing now. You got a, um, it's what you call a hog's head. And it's about as big as that door, but it's around about three feet tall. And then they put all that stuff in, and it's easily moved in there. The other day. Yeah. But I know. That's no shame in running. You move when you have to. <laughs>
he can run it faster than I was. He's behind me. <laughs> we came, we got even with him. We came back the next morning. We got him. We, got, but I, we, we didn't find him. We didn't know who it was. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I tell you, sometimes you have some funny things happen, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was the sheriff told me that I wouldn't have used a gun. And uh, I would come in, you know, and the guy scuffling and all this sort of thing, and he told me two or three times, I didn't, I didn't hire you to fight. If you got to fight, if you got to fight somebody, you got to shoot them. And so I, 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 I couldn't cut that. I, <laughs> So I fight, and the last time, the last time he caught me in the bank, was saying he had told me about not wearing the gun, and I was in the bank, and he told me that if I uh, where was the gun, I said it was in in the car, and so he had told me about it a couple of days before that, and then the next day he saw me in the bank, and he said you fired. You go ahead. So <laughs> I didn't think it was right for him to fire, but I wasn't going to argue about it, so I, I went over to get my stuff. And he came over that afternoon and said, I'm telling you, and then he's giving me the lecture again about the gun and what it was for and all that sort of thing, you know. So I started a little, uh, wearing the gun a little bit. And then he, started telling me about how I could get killed and I'm just putting myself out there. You know, and you're going out there and you don't know what these guys got and if they're going to attack you, they intend to kill you because you're a cop and you got to stop this foolishness. It dawned on me he was absolutely right. But I was only 29 inches in the waist and the gun was all comes <laughs> It's sometimes a trouble and I hated to bother with it. But, uh, I started doing what he said. He was a, a just a remarkable guy to me. Uh, very level-headed. Uh, didn't really get excited about too much. Don't mess with enemy's men because he sure take up for them. He was a guy that you could, you had to respect him because he respected you. You see, and. Uh, he didn't do anything that he, you, he wouldn't ask you to do anything with, uh, uh, that he wouldn't do himself. He'd get down with you. He'd crawl on the ground and up under the trees and everything else along, along with you. That's all he did. So you, you got to admire the guy because he's right behind you. Lanny was actually, he started as a deputy. Uh, the first uh, chief deputy under uh, John Norville was uh, C.M. Floyd, Tiny Floyd, they called him. And Tiny died in, in office about six months after he uh, was hired. And then uh, the sheriff appointed his son chief deputy, Lanny. And I worked with, uh, probably worked with Lanny more than uh, anybody else. And Lanny was the same way. Same way, same mold. Yeah, same mold. I uh, made lieutenant sometime in uh, 1965 and remained uh, a lieutenant. I think I was in sh uh, a supervisor at the jail for, for the jail and uh, back then the jail, the civil department, the warrant division, communications. And then uh, I was promoted to uh, chief deputy in uh, 1977. Drugs were not a problem in the uh, when I came to work, or even into the 60s. In the early 70s, drugs uh, started running rampant along the East Coast, and uh, we had what they call the uh, the Army and the Navy running running uh, marijuana 
They would bring it in by boat and they'd also fly it in out west of town. Uh, it, it kept us, it really kept us going. Captain Duval was in charge of the narcotics union and we had uh, several narcotic agents that were uh, there, Mike Monahan, Denny Hollinger. Some were landing out in out the west of town, but the main thing was in Port St. Lucie because you had so many streets. There were no no houses or anything. Just, and, and we used to call that Port St. Lucie Inter Inter International Airport. <laughs> General Development uh, Corporation had built a bunch of roads, uh, which is now Port St. Lucie. And uh, they would fly those aircraft uh, in at night and uh, and actually run strings of lights uh, on the roadway to uh, when the planes would come in and they'd kick them off and the planes would take off. We, uh, they would, they had these uh, cement uh, pillars that were marked uh, that General Development had put up for street signs. And uh, we uh, later found that uh, in checking those streets before dark that they would knock those uh, street signs over so that wings would not tip uh, those markers. And uh, we could stake it out and usually catch uh, some when they came in. We'd, we'd sit on that place. And one night, one afternoon, rather, the sky came in. And I just happened to be in that area. And uh, I saw the plane. I didn't, see, I didn't see it land. And they were unloading it. And I got behind him, and the guy, this, the plane was still, uh, the engine was running. And next thing I know, that guy, came, I didn't know he could go around the corner like that. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I tried not to hit the plane or what, but when it turned and it hit the, the left side, I believe, with the left wing. Yeah, it was the left wing, and the left part of it there. And it took off. The election was in November, and uh, when uh, Sheriff Norville got beat, uh, and the new sheriff was to take office in January, so we really didn't have much, too much time. Fortunately, I had uh, time enough to retire uh, with 30 years plus uh, four years military time, and uh, basically, after I did retire in uh, in January of uh, '85. I uh, didn't, uh, I laid out for two years before I went back to work. I did some work with a bail bondsman here uh, to help her clear out some bond cases and pick up some people who had skipped bond. And, uh, but uh, I stayed uh, unemployed till I went to work with the clerk's office so uh, two years after I retired. I helped them establish a, an evidence uh, room and uh, in fact to this day I still help maintain that evidence room. I was getting too old and I knew I, I was too old to do anything like that you know and you know when you just I had enough I'd worked all my life and I needed thought I needed to rest this was it I was already 65, going to be 65 that year, so just thought, by golly, this was it. I don't think I'd have stayed, no. I missed the job. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the 9-11 section wouldn't let me forget it for a couple of weeks. I, uh, like I said earlier, I was called to a number of major crime scenes every time or if something happened to some of the men. The first night that I left, the uh, new sheriff took over at midnight. At 12.15, my phone rang, and uh, I was advised by 9-11 that uh, one of the officers had been involved in a, in a rear-end collision at, uh, at uh, US-1 and Georgia Avenue, and uh, I said, uh, Don, uh, you're going to have to call somebody else. I'm, I'm not in any, he apologized, and an hour later, I was called again about a shooting, uh, which uh, it wasn't the same uh, supervisor that was out there that called me. But uh, 
That happened several times in two weeks after I left. I think the, the only thing is was not going to work. You, you, you had this, you've been regimented for years and here you get up and then you, it's hard to break that habit, you know, hard to break it. And sometimes when in all these things you, you thought you were going to do and you wanted to do and then and you, after years you said, I wish I had a job before, back on the job. <laughs> Because people keep your mind going, you know, and things to do. It's a very re rewarding career. And you can, uh, or at least it has been for me. I enjoy helping people. Uh, and I have all, all through my career in law enforcement, as well as working with the clerk of the court. Uh, to me, I don't know, it, it was something, I just like being around people, helping them. And this is, it was really, I really enjoyed it. It was an enjoyable thing. You get tired, yes, you get tired of everything, but then overall, yes, I liked it. I liked it. We didn't get a day off for five years. Um, maybe it's around five years or something like that. Now, I remember telling the sheriff that I, I didn't think I was making over 13 cents an hour in the day we, we were working. But in the early years, we, we, we did all of it. We worked in the jail and, and served civil papers, worked in the office, and worked in the courtroom, and uh, served warrants. Back then, uh, you knew everybody in town.